Hi, everyone. I'm Jean O'Toole. I'm the Executive Director of the New York Beef Council. Thank you for all signing up and joining us today. We have a fun-filled, action-packed hour, and uh, we're super excited to be here. Um, this whole virtual opportunity is being presented to you by the New York Beef Council, and this is made entirely possible through the partnership with the Iowa Beef Council. Iowa has a lot of cows. We have a lot of people, so we often have a lot of our states throughout the union share their beef dollars with us so that we can communicate the benefits and the awesomeness of beef. So our, uh, our main host tonight or the, the main event is the steak and of course the butcher, Mark Alia. And Mark is a retired instructor, instructor from the Culinary Institute of America at Hyde Park. And he is the owner of Hudson Valley Sausage Company. So I am going to exit out of this screen real quick and we're gonna spotlight Mark, which will be super, super easy because there we go. And uh, hopefully everybody can see now, just some housekeeping events before we start with you, Mark. If you have a question for Mark, put it in the chat. Don't unmute yourself. Um, we may be able to ask questions near the end. We may go a little over if, if you wanna hang with us, that's awesome. But most definitely ask your questions in the chat and I will do my best to interrupt Mark as we go along. So Mark, are you ready? I sure am, G. All right, without further ado, Mark Alia. And what do you got there, Mark? Well, Jean, first I want to say thank you very much for allowing me to be a part of such a wonderful educational arm of this industry. Thank you. So what do we have here in front of us today? We have the boneless ribeye. Uh, in my opinion, this is probably the king of steaks. The flavor is just I believe is unmatched by any others. And I, I tell you for the longest time, I was probably a T-bone porterhouse guy. But uh, the more ribeyes I eat, the, the less T-bones and porterhouse I eat. But anyway, here comes, this is the, the best represented section of the whole animal right here. And when we talk about different muscles and where they come from on different parts of the animal, we have to look at what do these muscles do are they motion muscles? Are they sedentary muscles? And the, the difference is this. Think of it as the animal has four legs and the animal has to carry this weight over four legs. Anything that's above those legs straight up is considered motion muscle areas. Those motion muscle areas have a tendency to be tough. Uh, they're, they get, they're heavily worked muscles, but the flavor is phenomenal, okay? A really good piece of chuck, which would come from the front shoulder of a steer, of a, of a cow, is just so marbled and so full of collagen and so full of flavor. Uh, it's just wonderful. But you're not gonna cook it the same way that you would cook this beautiful piece of boneless ribeye. The boneless ribeye is considered a sedentary muscle. The ribeye does not have a lot of motion. Think of it, if you were riding a horse or riding a bull, if you sit in the middle of it, you're going to have a little bit nicer ride than if you sat up on the front shoulders or if you sat up on the rear hind legs. You sit in the middle, and that's where the, it's a sedentary muscle. It doesn't nearly move nearly as much. It's phenomenal, okay? So understanding where the muscle comes from on the animal will help you know how you're going to cook this. This is a dry heat cook, whether you're putting it in the oven to make a prime rib roast, or whether you're gonna slice it and put it on the grill. It's high dry heat. You cannot take this and put it in a pot roast. You'll destroy it. It will just, it'll just be horrible. Okay, it's just not designed for that. This is designed for high dry heat. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get started and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the word prime rib. The prime rib, very often is mistaken for prime grade. People, the average customer today in a, in a grocery store or in a butcher shop, they will come in and ask for a prime rib for Christmas dinner, which is your number one Christmas dinner. Sometimes people think that they're because they're asking for prime rib, they're automatically going to get prime grade. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing. 
However, if you're if you're patronizing your local butcher shop, more than likely he's going to have that higher grade of beef, that second, maybe third tier of choice. Uh, upper so, tier. Uh, Mark, real upper quick, tier. I did put up the slide that's saying understanding beef quality grades showing prime choice and select right now. Yes, good. Prime choice and select. In USDA standards, there's nothing higher than prime. The marbling scores are high. The marbling, which is the white flecks of fat that you see within the muscle, are tight. Uh, they're, 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 they're abundant. They're overly, some, I would say some people would say overly abundant. When you get into the choice level of meat, you'll see that the, 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 the flecks of the fat are, are not so tight. They're not so abundant. They're a little bit spread out. And the intermuscular fat and the ex, ex, uh, intramuscular fat, they're different. They're, there's less. There's less. Intermuscular fat, intramuscular fat, two different types of fat. Okay, one is inside and one is the wraparound fat or the outside. Okay, the fat is flavor. Let's face it, fat is flavor. And when you've got a nice piece of meat that's marbled, as well as you have a nice layer on the outside, is nothing better. So then we go down to the, the lower of the three top, two, the top grades of beef, prime choice and select. And select is it's okay. It's got its place in the industry, but you got to be careful. If you're buying select and it's a piece of chuck roast, or if it's a piece of rump roast, not so bad because that's going to go into the pot roast anyway. But if you're buying select grade and you're going to, your main intention is to uh, grill it outside or make it a, an oven roast, uh, you're not going to be very happy because it's, it's going to cook dry. There's not enough fat in it because prime, most fat, Choice, nice arrangement of fat, good fat covering, select much less fat, okay? Less fat, less flavor, okay? So- And we often say, Mark, just say, you know, there's nothing wrong with select, same vitamins and minerals, same everything, that if you are gonna get something that is select and it happens to be one of like a rib or a strip stick, then marinate it and that'll help um, with the tenderness. Absolutely, absolutely, you can even, Use the spring-loaded uh, jacquard machines. I, I think uh, it's a, they're, they're little tenderizers. You could use that uh, to help you a little bit, and that'll also make them marinate a little bit nicer. Um, they're meat tenderizers. You can find them in your in your local grocery stores, or if you have a restaurant depot in your area, I'm sure they have them. Okay, there's several different brands out there, but they're meat tenderizers. They're little needle, uh, handheld needlers. They're all spring-loaded, and that's a big help when you have a piece of meat that's select. Uh, it's a real big help for you. Okay. So you want to get into cutting this? Are you ready? Yeah, so now you have that in that package. Explain that, that, uh, that type of uh, uh, packaging. Sure. This is called vacuum sealing or cryvac packaging. This is a factory sealed product right here. This is factory sealed. And one of the coolest things about this is what's done to this meat before it's sealed. The term is called antimicrobial intervention step. All the meat is sprayed with a lactic acid of several different forms. Could be something as simple as lemon juice. Uh, there's many different kinds. There's the, the commercial brand, there's thing, uh, something called beef excide that the muscles are sprayed and then they are sealed in these bags. And with that being said, if the seal doesn't break, you've got up to 30 days with no problem whatsoever. Now, you've heard of the term wet aging and dry aging. Well, wet aging is nothing more than leaving this piece of meat in this bag as long as the seal has not been compromised. As soon as you see the seal compromised and the bag starts to become loose, it's done. You've got to get it out of there and you got to use it. It's not like you can take it out and reseal it and put it back in for another three weeks. It doesn't work that way. Because once you've allowed air or oxygen to get into this, into this arena, then you, you no longer have that protective piece of meat. Now, on occasion, if you're buying a whole muscle like this and you get it home and you open it up, you may get a smell that could be a little bit offensive. 
it's called gas. We just, it's, a, we call them gassers sometimes when, when they open up like that. If the product is of good quality and it has not been compromised, that smell will diminish. It's basically the purge. Okay, this is not really blood. Okay, this is purge. The beef animal is 72 to 75 percent water. What you're seeing here, this bloody looking liquid, is nothing more than water and minerals. That's all it is. It's not really blood. The blood is removed from the animal during the slaughtering process. This is the actual water that's inside the product, inside the meat itself. If you were going to dry age a piece of meat, first of all, you would never dry age something like this. This is a boneless piece of meat that's been fairly trimmed down already. There's not enough fat cover protection to be able to get a good dry age on this. Dry aging items, if you want to dry age a rib, prime rib, you need to buy it with the bone on it and you need to have the fat cap still intact. Then you can go ahead and do your dry aging procedure. Uh, if you want to dry age another piece of meat, like a short loin of beef where your porterhouse and T-bone steaks come from, that's a great item to dry age because you can get a lot of fat, leave a lot of fat on the inside and the outside, and, you can, and it's got the bone in it, and it just tastes so much better. It's incredible. Okay. Uh, let's see. We covered the dry aging knowledge, uh, the general grading knowledge. Um, we're going to open this baby up. We're going to talk about it. This, I think I mentioned earlier, this is the best representation of the whole carcass, the, the prime rib area. The grading is done between the 12th and the 13th rib. There's 13 ribs on each side of the carcass. And the grating, it's, it's cut open. And what is exposed is the rib eye area. And that's where the USDA inspectors will come down with their cameras and they literally measure the fat content, the marbling abundance, and that's how they can come up with their grades of prime choice select. And it goes further down, but we don't need to go there. Okay. So to open these up, I would always recommend that you open it up from the tail area, never up in here where the eye muscle is. Uh, just cut from one end to the other. And you can see already how the purge will start to come out. Never, never, ever wash meat. Okay. Uh, I've had so many people over the years say to me, well, I'll take it home and I'll wash that off. It'll be okay. Well, no, please don't do that. You're not, you're not doing any favors to the, to the finished product. And all you're doing is washing out the minerals and some of the nutrients that are in here. So please don't wash the meat. If that odor that we talked about earlier doesn't go away after a minute or so, you might need to bring that piece of meat back and have the butcher look at it because maybe it was just in that bag a little bit too long and maybe it is a little bit spoiled. But again, most of the time, quite often, that won't happen. Okay. So the boneless ribeye. This is nicely trimmed. Uh, this is almost what we would call in the industry block ready. This underneath here, uh, these little strips of meat this is the meat that's in between the ribs. I believe the technical name for this is intercostal meat. I will tell you that if you were to take these off, take these little strips of, of this rib meat off, this right here is a meal in itself. These are so good, so tender, so delicious. I just put in the chat box that uh, what you're doing and how the fact that it is so tasty. Yes. Okay. These are so good. You just put these in the frying pan with a little uh, garlic oil, maybe some mushrooms and some onions. And oh my God, you could even cut these into strips if you choose to. Look at the marbling. So Mark, real quick, while you're yeah. doing 
Now you've got an, an awfully fancy, really sharp knife there. And uh, can you tell people that they don't have to go and, you know, get like the top of the line, what kind of knife would they need to do the cutting that we're doing today? And, uh, you know. He, th this particular knife that I'm using here is, it's nothing more than a 10 inch breaking knife. It's a butcher's call them breaking knives because this is what we would typically like to use if we're breaking down carcasses. And I like to have the fluted blade. Uh, it just glides through the meat a little bit easier as compared to the straight blade. Okay, this the fluted blades make, and you can get the fluted blade with a, a knife this large as well. And they're you know they're available online. They're available at your local cutlery store. You don't need to spend three hundred dollars on a knife. I'll let you in on a little secret. I have been cutting meat for 46 years. Okay, well, I can't say 46 yet because it's not May. In May, it'll be 46 years. We'll round up. Okay, but I've been in this industry since I was 17 years old. This knife right here, $28. $28. A lot of my students at the school when I was teaching, the finest culinary school in the world, I was just dumbfounded to see the amount of money that some of these kids would spend on knives. Two, three, four hundred dollars on a knife to do this. I just can't understand it. And I would say to them, why? Well, it's the best knife out there. So sure. And most kitchens today have ceramic tile or quarry tile on the floor, or maybe it's even a concrete floor and it's painted. I don't know. You drop that $400 on a $400 knife on that floor and you knock the tip of it off, you're crying. When I drop this on a concrete floor and I knock the tip off, I just go into the drawer and grab another one for $28. So you don't need to spend all that money. What you do need to understand is how to sharpen the knife. Okay. And there's, I would imagine there's a cutlery store in your area that can sharpen a knife for you. And then it's up to you to keep the edge. It's up to you to keep the edge. Get yourself a decent, Sharpening steel, honing steel, and don't get crazy. Just nice, light, up and down both sides. Use the whole steel. Use the whole blade. Okay? Just get used to doing that. Get that muscle memory on that angle, and you'll maintain a sharp knife. I sharpen my knives maybe, maybe once a month, and I use them every day. I maintain them on a really good steel. And there's plenty of steels on the market today. You got ceramic ones. Uh, you've got uh, diamond ones, uh, you've got fluted, uh, you've got smooth, there's all kinds of different ones. But look at that, look how beautiful. And that's not even, we're not even into the steak yet. Look how gorgeous that is. Imagine putting that in a stir fry, right? Forget about it, I'm gonna eat it raw. <laughs> okay, so we'll just put these over here for now. Okay. All right. So we take off the bottom. We look for any kind of connective tissue that we don't really want. We might clean it up a little bit. Some people would want to take a little bit more fat off the bottom. Okay, again, uh, lay your knife flat. We call this flat trimming, flat trimming, where our knife is literally flat and we're just taking off what we would consider the unwanted. Unwanted because you don't want it on your steak. But how do you think it would be if we took that unwanted and put it in a hamburger? Okay, maximum utilization is the key to success when it comes to cutting meat, when it comes to running a restaurant. And why not use maximum utilization in your home, in your kitchen? Why not? Why throw things away? A lot of hungry people in this world. We don't want to throw anything away. On the one end of the strip of the uh, Ribeye, there might be a little bit of connective tissue. Just got to be a little bit more careful. Just take that out of there. Just want to get that out of there. That's all. But again, it's not bad. It grinds up, makes a beautiful hamburger. Okay. As far as the tail goes, well, now we're going to call, we're going to run what we call a bevel cut. We're going to bevel down the edge. Okay. We're flat trimming, but we're following the angle of the muscle, and we call that beveling, beveling. And again, as long as it's not too fatty, why not put it into the grinder? Okay, so that's our bottom side. Some chefs will want you to take all of this off. I personally don't. 
I want that fat under there. I want that little bit of flavor while I'm cooking. So let's roll it over. Let's look at the top. As you can see here, we have no fat cover, which is pretty typical for a boneless ribeye. But over here, I'm kind of thick, I'm kind of dense. So I'm gonna take my knife and I'm just gonna do some more flat trimming and some more beveling. You see the skin right here? That little piece of membrane, we don't want that on there. Okay, but you notice how I'm not going down straight. I'm following the angle. We're beveling, We're following the shape of the muscle. And that's gonna help us in a few minutes when we go to the feature here, the sweetheart thing, because I'm bringing the point of the heart to a nice sharp edge. Any questions out there? Jamie, we got any questions? No, I don't have any questions. I, I have a couple of people saying that they're really hungry and uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really cool. But yes, if you have any questions, just a reminder, go ahead and put it in the chat and I can uh, relay it to Mark. I'll actually ask one too. When you're, how do you go about ordering this? Like, what would you ask for? I think that's something that I struggle with myself when I go to the store. Like, how do you ask for something like this? In particular? I just realized my hands in the video. <laughs> it's a very simple term. Just you want boneless ribeye. That's it. You want a piece of boneless ribeye. Now this is a whole leg. This probably weighs 14, maybe 15 pounds. Uh, you know, this is, this is an expensive cut here. This is not a cheap cut. This is your money. This is one of your big money cuts. This is probably the most expensive cut right now, other than filet mignon. And we won't talk about that. But um, you go to, you're going to ask for a boneless ribeye, and hopefully this is what you're going to get. Okay, well, it should be what you're going to get. Okay? Mark, can you know. be, can they be more? Be Mark, can they be more specific and ask specifically for the 112A, which is kind of the industry order number? Yeah, it, it is, uh, Gene. Yeah, you could ask for a 112A, but I, I got to be honest with you, unless uh, unless that butcher has been behind that counter for a whole lot of years. Right. They're not going to know the NAMP numbers. Gotcha. NAMP numbers are, are industry specialists' numbers. Uh, the, the executive chefs and the chefs and the, and the guys like myself who, who, are, who are buying meat like this. Uh, the NAMP book is a fabulous tool. It's, it's the Bible of the meat industry. There's no question about it. Uh, but uh, you're going to go to, if you go to a grocery store and you tell you need a 112A, uh, they might look at you a little funny. <laughs> They might look at you. They might not understand what you're talking about. But if you go to a seasoned veteran, like such as myself or someone my age, they're going to know what you're talking about. If you say 109, they're going to know you're talking about an export rib. Uh, if you say 123, they're going to know you're talking about short ribs. Okay. But All right, and should they ask some um, state that they want the subprimal to be able to get that whole cut? Otherwise, I know I've asked for a boneless ribeye and have gotten a boneless ribeye steak. So. Yeah, you got to ask for the subprimal boneless ribeye. That's the key term, subprimal. So what does subprimal mean? Okay, very simple. There's typically four ways to purchase beef. You have the primal cuts. And the primal cuts on the steer are the round, the loin, the rib, and the chuck. And the back of the animal going forward. I always want to look forward. I don't want to look back, but I always want to look forward. Okay, so you got the, the round, the loin, the rib, and the chuck. Those are your primal cuts. As far as price per pound goes, the cheapest way to buy, absolute cheapest way to buy, price per pound. Now, from your primals, you get the next phase down, which is subprimals, which is, this could still be considered a subprimal, okay? Uh, when I took it out of the bag, it would be a subprimal. In a few minutes, it's gonna be an HRI cut. All right, so you got primals, cheapest way to buy, but you've got to buy a lot because primals are heavy. Subprimals are the, the muscles. Then we got further fabrication of the subprimal is an HRI. HRI stands for Hotel Restaurant Institution. That's where, uh, that's where you're going to your big companies, your big hotel chains. And that's how they're buying. They're buying HRI cuts. They're buying things that we consider block ready. Uh, a bonus ribeye, almost block ready. I had to take this off, which you saw before. And there may be some guys who would like to take a uh, top layer membrane off. But if, if I was to get a ribeye roll, a ribeye roll, let me just face it's, this. Um, so, can see. so Mark, yeah. before you, get, you dive too deep in this, um, I do have a question that if you get something this large and plan to cut it into two rows, 
Would it be best to trim it all at once before cutting, packing, and freezing, or trim the second roast at, at a later time? Okay. I would not trim unless I knew what my, I was ready to use that finished product. Okay. So if you're gonna if you're gonna do a roast, you want to do a roast later on. You want to cut it in half. You want to freeze it. Leave that half untrimmed. Leave it untrimmed. Uh, it, I don't like pre-trimming. I do it because you know I've done it for so long that I know exactly where to stop. But to someone who's a little bit a little bit green, so to speak, uh, you might not you might dig in. You might gouge a little bit. And you don't want to do that. We can always take it off, but we can't put it back on. We just can't put it back on. So go slow. Take it easy. Shave it. Shave it. Shave it. Shave the balloon. Okay? Don't take it off and break everything. Just shave the balloon. Take it nice slow. But I would not pre-trim unless I knew exactly what I was doing. If I was a little bit nervous, I would say, okay, let me cut the steaks, and then I can determine how much fat I want to leave on there. You know, dad likes it with a little bit more fat. Mom doesn't want any fat. So if you pre-trim it, you don't have that luxury of that adjustment. That's perfect. And just to give you an estimate uh, uh, to know where you're at, it's um, it's about 7.30. Okay, we're good. Good. What? Okay. I, I didn't just start doing my impressions yet. <laughs> <laughs> because hey, you, need to, you need to do an impression of a butcher. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. All right. So I, I took the face of this off so you could get a really good look. Look at that marbling. Look at the color of the meat. When the inspectors look at this, they look at color, they look at uh, marbling, intermuscular fat, intramuscular fat, okay? They look at all these things and that's how they score. That's how they put their marbling scores on. That's how they determine prime choice or select, okay? Now, again, this could be considered an HR rod. It's a further fabrication of the one of the uh, boneless ribeye, okay? The fourth way to purchase meat and the most expensive way price per pound to purchase meat is buying portion cuts. And what's a portion cut? Very simple. It's a portion cut. Okay. Why would you pay somebody to do that for you? You saw how easy that was. Why would you pay someone to do that for you? Okay. Now some people, they don't care. It's okay. I don't want to cut the meat. I don't want to get, I don't have the knife. I don't have the room. I don't want to buy the whole piece. So you buy your portion cuts. That's fine. Okay. Everything has its place in the industry. I don't like to see restaurants buy portion cuts. But I know that I can teach them how to fabricate this to get the most out of it and not throw any trim away. And then they got their portion cuts. And they save like probably $4 a pound. The difference between portion cuts and this whole piece here is about $4 a pound. Okay. So there's your one of your first steaks. So today's feature is the sweetheart steak, okay? The sweetheart steak. How did that ever come about? Well, because it's one of the only muscles, at least the only one muscles that I know of, that we could turn into a beautiful shape. So what are we going to do first? You can't take a sweetheart steak from every section of the boneless ribeye. You only get a, you get a few out of here. So I'm going to cut off another portion, okay, my god, look at that. Look, like if they're going to cut those steaks by portion, should it be an inch thick, inch and a half thick, um, as you're cutting just those couple pieces right there? Sure, I can tell you through my personal knowledge and experience that anything less than an inch thick is just too hard to cook. You're going you're gonna to cook it, it's, it's going to cook way too fast. You got to go at least an inch, and in my house, we're looking at an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half. I think right there, that's it right there. I, it sells itself right there. You put a couple of those in the package, or put those on the plate, and it just sells itself. So now, so that's your inch and a quarter. This is your one inch. You can see the difference. If you go any less than this, you're looking at something you're going to want to pan fry. And I don't know. I just never liked pan frying steaks. I don't get me wrong. I've done it. I've eaten plenty of them. But if my choice, if I have my choice, it's going to be 
uh, a ribeye on the grill. Maybe uh, something like this, the inch and a quarter steak. I might go maybe three, four minutes on each side. That's my liking. Yeah. Okay, but uh, some people want to go, they don't want to see any, uh, uh, what they call blood. They don't want to see it too rare. Okay, so they'll go, you can go five, six minutes on each side. And that'll give you medium. Okay, okay so now we want to get into this. I'm going to go, I'm going to go an inch thick. I'm going to cut through. And I'm not going to go all the way. I am not going to go all the way down. Okay. But I'm going to go to my next one. And I'm going to cut that an inch thick. Okay. We'll shift this out of the way just a little bit. And then we will open this up. This is also known as a butterfly cut. Okay, and then again, we'll come in and we'll shape the heart a little bit more. What says I love you more than that piece of meat right there? That's, that looks perfect. That's good. Looks okay. beautiful. Now, I did it once. You're probably not going to remember. So let me do it again. Now, you see how we're getting that that layer of fat coming in, right? This top section right here is called the decal. If I was home right now and if I was cooking this, my wife would immediately take this and I would get the rest. And I'm okay with that, okay? Can I get the rest of it? I get the most of it. But the decal is, oh, so good, so tender, so delicious. It's actually so number three in tenderness, Mark. So the, the rib eye portion itself, which is the middle of the heart, and then that that extra that outside cap that ribeye cap that we call it that's yep. actually number three in tenderness. So number one is the fillet, number two is the flat iron. That's number three. Yep, and it's so tasty, right? So tasty. So let's do this again. Let's do this again. We're gonna come in one inch. Now, if you notice, I got my finger over the blade. This is a technique that I always used to love to teach my students, especially the newbies. They would come in and grab a hold of this knife and, and they, they got like a death grip on this thing. And next thing you know, they're cutting like this and they're cutting like this. And I got wedges and, and I got, if I was in the door stopper business, we'd be a millionaire with these, some of these guys, okay? So you take that finger and you put it over the blade. Now, why? Because here's why, very simple. If I have my knife like so, and I need to go straight with my knife, look what I have to do with my whole arm. I got, to, I got to turn, literally, I have to turn my whole arm. I feel that all the way up to my shoulder, okay? So if I take the knife and I just swing it around and I put my finger over top of that blade, I can go all around the circles. I can do figure eights. I don't feel anything up in here. And if you're going to be cutting meat for any length of time, you don't want to have sore muscles, okay? It, it's painful after a while. So I have much better control. This is now my steering mechanism. That finger becomes my steering mechanism. It also helps me keep the knife straight. So when I stand at the butcher block, I don't stand dead on. I stand off to the side a little bit. I put my finger over the blade. I size up where I'm going to be. Okay. I'm always looking to make sure I got, you know, if you're, if you're new to this and you're not quite sure, take and make yourself a little line. Make a little line. Give yourself something to start with. Okay, see how I did that? I didn't damage anything. I just put a little tracer. Go ahead and follow. Start your cut. The least amount of times back and forth that you have to go with the knife, the nicer the cut will be. Okay, now I almost went all the way through that and basically two, maybe three moves. Go to the next one. Again, size up. If I'm a little bit nervous or if I'm new to this, I'll go ahead and I'll make another line. This one, I'm going to go all the way through with. Remember, on this one, I didn't go all the way down. I stopped probably a little sooner than I had to, but I could always open it up again when I lay it down. Down we go. All the way through. Pull back. Let's get this out of the way. Let's lay it down. Now we can just gently open it up. 
until it lays down. Okay, and again, we can come in, we can trim the bottom up a little bit, get that heart shape a little bit nicer. If I knew how to make a rose out of a piece of meat, I would put it right there. And I just put in the chat, like cooking suggestions can be found at beefitswhatsfordinner.com. As far as cooking temps in the industry, they suggest beef be cooked medium rare. And that's an internal temperature of 145 degrees. And it'll give you the number of minutes and stuff on each side. Um, and as far as whether it's the skillet or the grill, but most definitely uh, I suggest medium rare, but those of you who are like a, a little less red and uh, medium would be 160 degrees. And if you like your meat well done, then log off right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there you have it. Now we're not done. There's a little more we can do with this. All right. Real Let's quick, Mark, before meat. you go on, somebody asked, can you do a more petite version for smaller eaters? Okay, if I was going to do that, I would have done that off the smaller end. And I'll try that over here. But the problem that you're going to see, this, this particular muscle has got some nice size to it. Okay. It's not a flat muscle. This is a nice, this is a nice animal that this came from. I'm not schooled enough to tell you what breed this is, uh, but I'm going to guess that it's probably a black Angus uh, because of the, the shape and the structure of the muscle. So they're big to begin with. So if you're looking for something smaller, you got to get to that smaller eye muscle, uh, that smaller ribeye. Maybe something that only weighs 12 pounds or 13 pounds versus something that weighs 18 or 17 pounds. However, what you could do, you could go to the other side, what we would call the first cut side. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna shave this off a little bit so you can see. Okay, the eye muscle here is a little bit smaller. See here how much smaller that is versus over here, considerably bigger. Plus, we don't have any decal on the other end, that, that top cap piece that we talked about earlier. That's so good. So we turn it over here. We could do the same thing. It's just the procedure doesn't change. We come in. See, I'm just cutting on the other side. Okay. Down we go. I could go a little thinner. I could go three quarters of an inch maybe. I don't like to, but I could. And then we go to the next one. Okay, now the problem here is, even though you're getting that smaller piece that you're looking for, the product is still gonna be phenomenal because of what it is, but you're just not gonna get that real pretty Guaranteed not to sleep on the couch. Ribeye. Okay, you see the difference here? See, we have the big decal here. We don't have that. We have very little decal here, very little top cap. So it gives you a little bit smaller. I really don't think you should cut it less than three quarters of an inch. I, I don't like cutting less than an inch, I'll be honest with you. But that it's a little bit smaller portion. So maybe get two meals instead of one. That's basically what uh, that she said and I said is it's called leftovers, so. So what else can we do with the rest of this? Well, you could literally at this point, maybe knock a little bit more fat off the back if you choose to, only if you choose to. I personally would rather cook it with this fat on there and then cut it off before I eat it if I chose to. But there was a time where I would eat all of that fat right out of the, right out of the oven, but uh, no more. Doctor said no more. Anyway, so you could tie this. We can literally tie this up. Uh, so whenever you tie a roast, always start in the middle. Always start in the middle and work your way out. So what's my spacing? Two fingers. Your two fingers, not mine. Okay. So you put a string there, put another string there, put another string there. Same thing over here. Boom. Two fingers. And you got this nice tied roast. Why do we tie it? It cooks better. It keeps the juices in and it looks really cool. All right. What else can I do? That, that would be your boneless prime rib roast. Your absolute number one best Christmas roast. So what else can I do? I can take that decal off of there. Okay. 
I can get underneath it, get that natural seam. It's a natural seam, see? I'm, I'm not really cutting as much as I'm pulling apart. So now you've got all of this awesomeness sitting right there, waiting to be cooked on the grill. Now, we could trim a little bit more fat off. We could, or we could cook it off. I'm flat trimming here, but I'm also beveling. I'm following the shape of the muscle. Okay. That's a little bit of connective tissue there. We'll get that out of there. There you go. Get that off nice and clean. Bend over. We'll clean this side up just a wee bit. Again, I don't want to take all the fat off. I don't want to take all that flavor off. Okay, clean up here just a wee bit. Over. That'll all cook down right there. All that fat will cook down. If you're really, really fat conscious and you want to take that out of there, well, I'll show you how. Take your small boning knife. This is what's called a uh, five inch curved bony knife. This is a stiff knife. Uh, I don't like the really flexible ones personally. You could take this, you get underneath that skin, pull it over your knife and just remove. Okay. Notice I'm only cutting in one direction. I'm only cutting back on the back stroke. That's how I like to do it. That doesn't mean this is the only way to do it. My partner at the school, he would always cut forward. I always used to cut backwards. Well, they say you should cut away from you unless you want to give yourself a splenectomy. Splenectomy. Well, listen, I, you know, I can't live forever here, you know? So, <laughs> well, here we go. I, I think I just have much more control because I'm taking this piece of silver skin or this little bit of connective tissue. I'm pulling it over the knife. I'm tilting my knife up just a little bit and I'm dragging my knife along the bottom of that silver skin. So all I'm taking is that, and I'm not touching any of the red. I don't want to touch red. Red is bread. Red is money. Red is money. So, so what, Mark? Could, is, oh, go ahead. go ahead, Mark. So you could literally do half of this and leave this on, and you'll see that this, it, it just eats so well. Go ahead, Gene. Question. No, no, I was just basically saying that cap right there can be cut into steaks and it can be cut into strips for an appetizer for the holidays. And, uh, and we often teach people how to cut this in a little bit more in-depth training, but, uh, or you can, you know, slice it thin like he is for another additional stir fry. Like I mentioned, this is um, super tasty. He could butterfly that cut of meat too and um, make a brujol out of it, stuffing it with, um, uh, spinach and feta, etc. like he, he's doing. So this is really versatile cut of meat and can go a long, long way and super, super tasty. Definitely impress your guests um, and uh, make for a, a really, really awesome meal. Watch this. Now let's say that we stuffed that. We opened, all I did was I butterflied that section. Okay. Let's say we stuffed that with whatever you choose. Like you had said spinach, uh, you know, some grated cheese, whatever. Then we 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 could uh, then we would roll it in. But I'm going to roll it backwards just so we can get an effect of this. And we can roll it like so. Of course, I wouldn't roll it backwards if I was stuffing it. Okay. But now we'll take the end off, and now we will have pinwheel steaks. Yep. Okay. Put a skewer through those. Put a couple of those on an appetizer dish. Hello, you made friends for life. All your neighbors were going to come to your house for dinner. All right, and then you're going to be calling me saying, what do I do now? Okay, so here's your strips. All right, again, you can clean these up a little bit more. Stir fry them. I would 
be a little bit careful on how much I took off. Yeah, I was going to say, actually, somebody just commented saying that looks like the rose you were talking about. You could put one of those pinwheel stakes and you have it serve as a rose there. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Huh? Boy, I tell you, too bad I couldn't make that in the shape of a heart, huh? <laughs> there we go. So there's a couple cool options for you. All right. So Mark, um, one more thing with the what's left over of that cap. If you trim it off and make a couple of like petite uh, or, or uh, ribeye fillets, um, you know, petite fillets. So some people like tenderloin steaks, but we found a way in the industry to kind of make the the uh, ribeye a, a, almost like a tenderloin fillet, like a fillet mignon. Okay, here we go. This is the point where we're gonna make ourselves, we're gonna give ourselves a little bit of room here. And a lot of these videos um, and how to break down that whole rib can also be found on Beef It's What's For Dinner. Tonight's uh, is being recorded, so it'll be on our YouTube channel and you'll be able to see it again. Um, you know, so it's a mix and okay. type of cut. What I'm gonna do, Gene, is I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna remove all of that tail fat. I'm gonna take all that flavor off. <laughs> okay, look at all that meat in there. We're not throwing this away. Again, if you're gonna do something like this, you're gonna cut that off, you're gonna put it in your grind. This would be a little bit too much fat to have in your grind, but we can get in here. Maximum utilization is the master key to success. It's the master key, not just the key. I know I said it's the key to success earlier, but it's the master key because it opens up all the doors, all the windows, okay? So there's no reason why we should throw this away. It goes right into the ground, okay? Ribeye burgers, house-made ribeye burgers. Okay, now we could also, now we take this little bit of chain muscle off of here. Now remember, every time we do something to this, we're making it smaller, and we're making it smaller, but we're getting down right into the middle of the, of the best piece on, in my opinion, the best piece on the whole animal, okay? So what else can I do here? I'm not done. You wanna make something that's a little bit more, somebody asked about the size of the steak before. So let's go. Let's take this, let's take it one step further. Let's clean it down a little bit more. I think you guys know what I'm gonna do here already. I kind of gave it away. I think I'm the happiest when I have a knife in my hand. I think so. I think so. So uh, with about 10 minutes left and he's gonna show you this one step and then the how you're gonna wrap it up is that you've got a lot of meat there. How are people going to um, store it and put it in the freezer was the best in a way of doing that. So after you cut that, that, that would be the next uh, item up for bid. And then we'll wrap things up of uh, some fun opportunities for everyone. Okay. Not everyone has access to a vacuum pack machine. I know that today's industry and, and all the home foodies, I know there's quite a few people now that have the small food savers at home. Uh, and I think they're wonderful. They really do a great job. So in the perfect world, that's what you would do. You would get a nice vacuum pack bag, you would use one of these, these countertop food sealers and you would suck all the air out of the package. And as long as, again, just like it was before, as long as you don't compromise that seal, it'll stay in the freezer for several months. As soon as that seal is broken, that's the next piece you have to use. Ziploc bags work fine as well, but you gotta remember it's short term. Ziploc bag, you can't get all the air out of a Ziploc bag, no matter how hard you try. You could put it in there and you could push it out and then you could seal it. Wonderful. But you're not going to get all the air out like you would if it was a vacuum pack bag. So you got to remember, if it's going to be in the freezer for two, three weeks, okay, Ziploc bag will work. If you're looking to keep it in the freezer for two or three months, forget about it. You're going to have ice crystals on the inside and you're going to ruin that beautiful piece of meat. But... I don't know what the little homemade vacuum packers cost, but if you're doing any kind of cutting like this where there's a good amount of meat, then I would highly recommend that you uh, that you invest in one. I really would. Okay, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna take this, and we're gonna cut it right down the middle. 
Okay. And again, we're going to look at what some chefs would do and some chefs wouldn't do. Some chefs would have me cut this completely off. This silver spoon. Again, I'm using my pullover cut. I'm angling my knife up. So that all I am doing is I'm removing the silver skin and very little red, very little meat. Red is bread. Okay, so that's off. Turn it over. And basically we'll do the same thing here. I'm gonna do a little flat trimming here first. Shave, I call this shave the balloon. We want to get that shaving cream off the balloon without cutting it. Okay, and then again, we come back. We do our pullover cut again. This membrane is very thin, and you could leave it on there with no problem. But some people are just really particular about how this stuff is trimmed. And you know what? It, it's okay. Whatever you want is, is what I want. If you want to come to my butcher shop and, and say you need a, a, a piece of ribeye completely denuded, that's what we're doing right now. We're denuding, D-E-N-U-D-I-N-G, denuding. Uh, that's what we're doing. We're taking all the silver skin off, all the fat off, and we are making this piece so lean. The only thing we're not doing, we can't do, is we can't take the marble right now. So you're still getting a great piece of meat. Now you notice how I'm only cutting in one direction? That's my style. Everybody has a different style. That happens to be my style. Okay, here we go. A little bit of flat trim. Very little red. And if I get too much red, where's, where's it go? Goes into the burger. So now, there's your filet mignon of ribeye. There's probably a special name for that. Um, Cheeks ribeye fillet is the special name, and um, this cut and recipes for this cut can be found on Beef It's What's for Dinner. Doesn't get any better than that, does it? No, it really doesn't. Those are beautiful. Thank you. Well, you guys, you have supplied me with some really great stuff here. All right, now this does one anybody here. have any questions for Mark? Put them in the chat. And if you stop right there, Mark. You can also you can also have like a little roast as well. No, oh. you can keep cutting, but you can have like just a little couple pound, three pound roast for you know something yeah. easy. If you if you uh, don't want to pay the money for Chateaubriand, then you would use this. There you go. Great stuff, Jane. Great stuff. Well, here we we cut our ribeye steaks. They were our first cuts off, and we chose to cut these off first because we knew we were going to end up with the Sweetheart steaks, and we wanted to get into that deckle or that top cap area. Okay, so here we have our one inch cut. I'm sorry, inch and a quarter cut. And this is your one inch cut. All right. Good for grilling. Okay, personal preference for me would be the one and a quarter. Sweetheart steaks, serving for two. Okay, you can see here the, how the fat layer changes. Gives you that beautiful shape. Okay. Trim the bottom a little bit, get the point of the heart there. We have the ribeye fillet steaks, I believe is what we called them. Uh, these came right from the center of this. So these steaks right here are literally this right here, the center of that muscle right there. Okay. Uh, we took the top cap off, which was this, the deckle. So here we see how we've got multiple uses for the same thing. We again we 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 took the center, we now we can make it into a roast. And before we had the piece all in, intact and we could tie that for a nice prime rib boneless roast. And what do we got over here? Again, this is more of the, the deckel meat that we filleted open. In this particular case, I was trying to uh, simulate a pinwheel steak, but again, you could do barjol. Uh, you could fill this with spinach and provolone cheese and seasonings and, and fresh parsley and oh my God. You can just go on and on. Put grandma's recipe in there. She'll love it. Okay. And over here, again, we have, this is the, uh, the chain muscle that came off. What do we do with the chain muscle? Very simple. Let's think of it this way. Everybody likes kebabs. All right. Look at the kebabs that we can make here with this. 
They're tender, they'll cook quick on the grill. Nothing gets thrown away. And what about all that trim that we had? Burger. Nothing better <laughs> than in-house burger. You don't have to worry about anything because you control it. You have the feet, you have the meat in your hands. It's not going to get damaged anyway. All right. So there you have. There's your kebabs. There's your fillet steaks. There's your roast. There's your pinwheels. Your ribeyes. Your sweethearts. There you have it. Thank you, Jean, so much. Really no, enjoyed. thank you, Mark. You're extremely talented. That looks awesome. Make sure you wrap that stuff up and bring it back to the beef council, uh, Ryan. I also like to thank the cameraman, Ryan Gross, who is our, uh, the person that has been uh, interacting with uh, you all um, to do this this whole, uh, this whole time. And uh, uh, also thank you to all of you for spending the last hour with us. Um, I, I hope this uh, wets your whistle a little bit and uh, it gives a drool effect that you're gonna try this at home. We can't wait to see what you could possibly create um, and uh, hopefully we'll see it in the next few weeks and uh, share, share, share as well. And uh, don't forget it's beef, it's what's for dinner at the, uh, at the dinner table, right, Mark? Go team beef. Yeah, there you go, go team beef. So uh, thanks everyone. Uh, that's the conclusion of this skill series on how to cut the sweetheart steak. I hope that you take it forward and cut one for your sweetheart coming up on Valentine's day and look for this recording on our YouTube in a few days and um, and all will be all will be good. So have a good evening, stay safe and uh, maybe someday we'll do this in person.